Parker Gasper for Living History. The B-17 bomber, like the one behind me, was the workhorse of World War II in the European theater. This versatile aircraft, known as the Fortress, due to its array of turrets and machine guns, was responsible for destroying the German war machine. With a 103-foot wingspan and four Wright Cyclone 1300 horsepower engines, it could carry an average of 4,000 pounds of bombs at a maximum speed of 300 miles per hour at a height of 30,000 feet. First designed in 1934, the B-17 did not see U.S. action until 1941 when America entered the war. Dick Hubotter was a gunner on the B-17 and on his 28th mission was unfortunate enough to be shot down and survive the rest of the war in a German POW camp. This is his story. Uh, I'm Dick Hubotter. I was born in Davenport, Iowa and spent the first 13 years of my life there. We moved to California. Uh, the family moved to California in 1935. I attended Mount Carmel High School and graduated from there in 1939 in the second graduating class of that school. Uh, in 1941, I went to work for the Douglas Aircraft Company as a uh, uh, riveter and uh, spent uh, about two years there. Uh, while I was there, I was trying to figure out what kind of service I wanted to get into, and when they dropped the requirement that you had to have some college education before you could get into the Air Force, I enlisted uh, and was told at the time of my enlistment that it would probably be about six to eight months before I was called up. So I was called to, called to active duty in January of 1943, uh, I reported to Santa Ana, and uh, there they decided that I probably wasn't fit to be uh, ready to uh, be an officer on an aircraft, and they washed me out. I pleaded my case, wanted to know if I could possibly be a gunner. They said, no, because your eyesight isn't that good, you can't. So from there, I was transferred to Fresno, and I knew I had to take another physical in Fresno, and so I cheated and went in, and and uh, um, uh, memorized the eye chart, passed the test, and from there I was signed up as an aerial gunner. And uh, my first spot of training was in Las Vegas, Nevada. The first time I was ever in an airplane, I was in the rear cockpit of an AT-6. We got up to altitude. The, the pilot told me to stand up and try to start shooting, and that's what I did. That was my first experience in an airplane at all. Uh, I think I hit the target pretty good, but who knows? Uh, after after finishing up successfully finishing up our, my training as a as a gunner, we were sent to uh, uh, mechanic school at uh, Shepherd Field, Wichita Falls, Texas. I finished that training. Uh, we became a comp. We, we became a, a unit to fly in B-17s in Alexandria, Louisiana. That's where I met all the rest of the members of the crew. And at that point in time, after we finished our training there, we were sent to England. What was your unit? Uh, well, we were assigned to the 306 Bomb Group and the 368th Squadron after we got to England. Uh, we went to England by boat. Uh, 
which and we spent uh, 14 days in convoy on a boat that really wasn't very good. Uh, it was uh, it was an old converted uh, uh, cruise ship from Australia, uh, run by the English. Uh, we had one area where there were I think 20 guys at a big long table, and that was our mess table. And in addition to that being our mess table, we also had to ha find a way to swing our hammocks so that we could sleep in that same area and what have you. Result of that was that because there was blackouts all over the ship at night, obviously, uh, we would either wear one of the one of the officers hats or their jacket or something and sneak up with them up to their cabin and sleep on the floor up there and it was a lot better than trying to sleep around that table the food on the ship wasn't all that great and uh, so we spent a lot of time uh, getting and standing in line to get to the px to buy cans of peaches and uh, uh, chocolate bars and things like that and oh and canned milk and uh, we ate and drank that, and that's that's how we got across the across across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, when we after we landed in uh, Liverpool, we were uh, we were sent to our location uh, of our airfield, which was outside of Bedford, and uh, that was right at D-Day when we got there. And we started to fly. Uh, the pilot and the co-pilot and the navigator uh, had a couple of missions before we did, and we started to fly as a as a unit on, I think it was the 10th of, uh, 10th of June. Uh, there were nine members of the crew. Uh, I, I flew practically all of my missions as a waste gunner, and my duties there, obviously, were to, to shoot the, the uh, 50 caliber machine guns, which were mounted on uh, either the left or the right side of the ship. We had, we had no real duties at the, at the base. Uh, uh, if we had any free time, obviously, we went out and we did some skeet shooting to keep uh, to keep abreast of our, our of our marksmanship, uh, and we also, as as far as our crew was concerned, we also did some uh, some training flying uh, right around England, as opposed to as opposed to going on actual missions. So we were kept pretty busy. Uh, we the this was this was of course right at invasion time when we were awful busy. And we would fly three days, we'd be down a day, we'd fly three days, we'd be down a day. So, uh, so we were kept more than busy just, just doing our regular duties as far as, as far as flying was concerned. Most of our flights were anywhere from, anywhere from five to over 10 hours, uh, depending on how far your missions were away. First mission, I think it was the 10th of June. Anyhow, it was, it was a mission, and, and it, that first mission was, was just across the channel to knock out, knock out one of these buzz, buzz bomb installations. And so anyhow, uh, this was our first experience. Uh, we got across, we, uh, we didn't see much flak, we saw no fighters at all or anything. We, were, we made a successful drop, we turned around on our way back. We, we didn't fly very high on that day. The, tape, t the tail gunner called up and he says, this is what ca combat is all about. He says, it's, it's a piece of cake. The next day we went to Hamburg, and that was an altogether different story. <laughs> but, but, well, it was a it was a raid to Hamburg, and and we were at, uh, on that raid. That was probably an eight nine hour run, and uh, our our target there was uh, was uh, an oil dump, and again we were successful in uh, knocking that out. Much much flack on that one, just an awful lot of flack. Um, and of course, that was and that was our our first baptism under fire, if you will, as far as that was concerned. Your tail and, his mind. Yes, he changed his mind awful fast, um, and for several days, as as we flew into Germany, you could see this big cloud of smoke out of out of uh, Hamburg. So obviously, it was a very successful mission. We had missions to Munich. We had missions to Leipzig. We had missions to Pinamundi, which was a which was a very low, we went there twice, a very long run, and most of it was over water because we went up up the North Atlantic and through the Baltic and what have you to hit Pinamundi. And and the reason why we were at Pinamundi was that's because they were the Germans were building jet aircraft. The V2 was also being developed up there at Pinamundi, and 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 uh, they were hydrogen fuel and everything else. They were working with the whole thing up there, trying to get that all put together. Uh, the one experience we had on one day that we, we were going up there was uh, that all of a sudden we lost power. And uh, 
dropped out of the formation, couldn't figure out what was going on. And all of a sudden, the pilot called up and he said, News Beagle, who was the radio operator, said, transfer the Tokyo tanks. And there was there were valves in the inside the Bombay where you took the the, the fuel out of the out of the wing tanks to get them into the, in, into the in in and that's what had happened. We just failed to do that, and we, we ran out of fuel. So anyhow, we, we got the we got the fuel going. We got the engines going again, and um, <clears throat> hooked on with another group and went ahead and did our did our bombing and came home. So, as you know, when you go into briefing, and they have a they have a map, and then the, over the map they have a, a set of draperies, and after you get all settled down, well, they pull the draperies out, and there's your route, and they they have it with yarn showing your way in and your way out. And they always show at the target area, they, 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 they show the air, anti-aircraft installations by globs of red, blotches of red around. And depending on how big those blotches of red are, depends on how much anti-aircraft installation. Well, down there in that Aurora Valley, that's just nothing but a great big blob of red. That's all it was. There were just anti-aircraft all over the place. So anyhow, that's where we're headed. And as we, uh, as we took, we took off and rendezvoused and everything else, and got along just fine. We uh, <clears throat> no no unusual things going in. Uh, we got to the IP just fine, and uh, we're initial point. That's where you're ready to start. We got there just on t on time and on, and and in good formation and everything. Uh, of course, you could see up in front of us. There was just nothing but black in front of us, where all the flak had been had been shot up there. And uh, so, anyhow, as we uh, as we were on the bomb runs, in all in all instances, the pilot would call up and he'd say, "Okay, what do you see?" Kind of way. give us a, give us a flak report. Well, the tail gunner called in. Uh, uh, he's well. He says there's a few bursts out here. About seven o'clock. They're pretty pretty far back. And I called in and I said, well, on the port side, about 9 o'clock, we got some off our wing. They're not close. And then all of a sudden, wham. And we got the first. They generally hit you in, in, in spurts of four. And we caught the first one on the, on the port wing tip, and that was gone. Uh, then, and then three more in, in rapid succession. It, it blew it off. They just, they just, blew, blew, just, blew, right, just blew the wing tip right off. Then we took three more in, in, in pretty rapid succession. Uh, the second one hit the Bombay. The third one hit near the tailwheel, and uh, that's the one where where there were some of the shrapnel out of that got my parachute before I'd put it on. And then the fourth one hit uh, the starboard wing between the two engines and knocked those out. Uh, now we still had communication on board, and uh, everybody was jabbering, of course. And I looked up overhead and saw that uh, the um, controls to the horizontal and vert vertical stabilizer, they just look like a bunch of spaghetti up there. And so you didn't have to be too swift to know that we'd had it. Anyhow, the, the, the pilot, uh, pilot made, the, uh, uh, made the order to bail out. So I got on my chute, and as I was getting on my chute, I noticed that I put it on backwards. And so I had the D-ring was on the left-hand side. And I had to remember that when I went out that I had to reach over there to pull it in order to, uh, instead of trying to find it over here, we're going to be over here. So anyhow, uh, this is a D-ring off of a parachute. Uh, and uh, I saved mine. And, uh, and because, because, you are, because you are saved by having to bail out of an airplane and using a parachute, you automatically become a member of the Caterpillar Club, which is a which is a, a a pretty exclusive club because it's only those people who are saved that are that are eligible to become a member. Anyhow, uh, I figured that as I as I was going out, seeing that my ship my my chute wasn't in all that great a condition, and also seeing that I had to pull it from the other side, that I better do that pretty quick after I got away from the ship. Uh, as I was going out, the, the ball turret gunner was right behind me, uh, and he had his chute on, and I looked and saw the radio operator coming out, of the, coming out of the radio room, opening the door and coming out of the radio room. And as I went out, <clears throat> I, I could feel that the ship was, was falling off. 
it was it was going to the left. Uh, anyhow, I jumped, and uh, uh, as soon as I thought that I was clear of the ship, I pulled my ripcord. The chute opened just fine, uh, <clears throat> and remember that we went out at 32,000 feet. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that at that point in time I blacked out. Uh, because there are certain, some things that I don't remember, and finally I do remember coming to, and I looked up and I could see that a couple of the panels in my chute were, were not in that great a shape, and uh, you could hear them flapping and, 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 and kind of ripping. And so hopefully it was going to get me down, <laughs> and it did. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, as I was descending, uh, it seemed like it took forever and ever to get down, but then when you get down to where you could recognize things on the ground, that ground was coming up awful fast. Uh, then I noticed that, uh, okay, the next thing was is that I'm, I'm set to fall into the river. This was the Rhine River. And there were boats and barges along this river, and so the next thought that, you know, these things all happen in, in, fast. But the next thing, <clears throat> the thing that goes through your mind is you're going to get impaled on one of those masts or one of those booms. Well, I did miss them, obviously, <clears throat> and uh, I hit the water. And in hitting the water at that speed, it was just like hitting a brick wall. Uh, I, I had sense enough to pull my way west, which is a, an inflatable thing that you wear around your neck. I pulled one of the CO2 tubes. I couldn't find the other one. I thought, I figured, well, one of them is fine, it's going to get me, so anyhow, I, I finally surfaced, and fortunately again, the, the current was swift enough to where my, my, my canopy had floated downstream so that I wasn't all jumbled, jumbled up in that. Having hit that water so hard, uh, I just, I, I tore up my back pretty good. I, I felt that I had broken some ribs I didn't know for sure at the time, and I had also wrenched, tore cartilages in both my knees. Uh, and uh, so I was kind of immobile at the time, but uh, they came and they, they, when I say they picked me up, uh, uh, they, they just rode up alongside of me and the, and the, and the, and this young, young boy reached over and just grabbed my shrouds, which were right here on my chest pack, just, and just, and they just pulled me into shore. I mean, he, they rode and pulled me into shore. There were a number of civilians on, on shore and, and Thankfully, I saw also that there was a, a Luftwaffe soldier, a, a German Air Force soldier there. The civilians weren't too happy with, with and, and uh, maybe it's jokingly, I don't know, but, but generally our missions always got us to the target around noontime. And I guess if I was a civilian trying to eat my lunch and I had to get out of there to go to a bomb shelter, I'd be kind of mad too. But, but uh, anyhow, they they didn't like what was happening to their country, and and, and rightly so, you know. And but they they were they were very adamant about about being angry about the war. And uh, so I was I was happy to see that there was a soldier there. Uh, anyhow, we started up. And uh, and I could I I I was aching something fierce, and he finally realized that that I wasn't in that good a shape, and so through motions and what have you, he he advised me to get rid of this chute. And so I you know and I, there I had to take off my harness and everything else, and my May West, and so I just left him there. And when we got up to a little, uh, uh, well, it was a farmhouse, and it was a, really a command post installation for an artillery unit is what it was, an aircraft unit is what it was. So we got up there and that's where I met Lieutenant Evans, who was our navigator. So because I was sopping wet and what have you, he gave me his heated flying suit and his leather boots. And this was, remember this was in August and, uh, and it was rather pleasant weather, well, kind of like weather we've got here at this time of the year. So, so uh, <clears throat> anyhow, we stayed up to this command post for about four hours, and uh, then they came around in a truck and they picked us up, and uh, that was, I mean, so we knew about ourselves, we didn't know about the other seven guys on the crew. 
this truck, apparently the job of this truck was to run around to the various parts of the aircraft and pick up things that were of value or what have you. Our first stop was in a, in a, in a uh, field and unfortunately there we saw a, there, was a, there was a car and it had a, a, um, a trailer on the back of it and on the back on, on that trailer was a pine coffin. Uh, also right there was a was a what we call a, a bunny suit. It was also a heated suit and this one the pretty cake one was blue and uh, <clears throat> that one was the, the the bombardier always wore that kind of a suit so our, our guess was that that was the bombardier and then uh, we went to another place where, where the cockpit was it was in the backyard of a, of a house and uh, they had advised us or through sign language they had wanted us to get out of the back of the truck and go with them and then they saw that I was badly injured injured and so they said stay and they they, the, they took the, the navigator with them and he had to go back out there and that was where um, the uh, co-pilot had gone down with the ship and he was still in the cockpit he had to help him take him out of there well, we went to another installation. It was a huge place, and it was had some kind of a military thing because there was there were military personnel all over the place, and so uh, 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 there they they brought the pilot out, and uh, he had been in there, and and he had either badly sprained or broken his ankle. I think it was just badly sprained, and they had wrapped his ankle for him or what have you, and he had met before that. He had met the top turret operator and tail gunner. So that accounted for five people. Uh, there was a time on, on, the, on the train that uh, uh, after we had left Wiesbaden that uh, the two fellows, the, 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 the navigator and the, and the uh, top turret operator who were not injured at all uh, decided that they would try to escape. And so they did. Uh, it was probably around midnight and they as as the train pulled out of the station they jumped the train and uh, and when they did that the door slammed the guards had been asleep and when they woke up uh, out come their lugers and they were brandishing these things all over and pointing them and what have you and of course we thought we had had it too you know but anyhow we got down to the next station they stopped the train uh, got on the next train coming back and when we came back well there were there were uh, uh, the whole the, the, the Wehrmacht was out there. The infantry they were out there and they had shovels and and, and clubs and maybe they're going to go beat the bushes. And so we stayed there for a while and then they finally decided we had to get on because they we had to go to Frankfurt because that's where you went to for interrogation. And uh, and uh, uh, after we left Frankfurt, we were assigned to uh, to different camps. Now the tail the tail gunner and I went to a camp. Uh, up in uh, in East Prussia, it was at, up near Stettin, which was right near the Polish border. In January 1945, the decision was made that 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 that, that this camp had to be evacuated, and so anybody who had spent any time in the infirmary, which I had done when I was there, uh, and they, that's where they taped me up and this and that and the other thing, uh, that uh, they were going to send those folks. To uh, the other camp in Barth, which was up on the Baltic, in just opposite Sweden, and uh, the rest of them were going to have to march out. So we were on a train. We, we were put on a train of, and uh, 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 freight cars, and we spent. I think this this is not a big thing to go from Stettin to Barth, but we were eight days on that thing, and of course we were always put over in a siding kind of a thing. We went through Berlin. And uh, we were in the marshalling. We didn't go into the station. We were in the marshalling yards there, and people were out beaten on the side. They knew who were in there, and they were out beaten on the side of the, of the freight cars and what have you. But we got through that all right. We got to Barth, and uh, we spent the rest of the rest of our time, as far as POWs are concerned, in Barth. Uh, and then, as in 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 the latter part of April latter part of April, again, the Russians were coming, okay? So uh, the dictates were that, that, um, that we were going to be marched out of that camp. 
And that's when we, you know, we, had, we had our own officers also who were in charge. These guys said, we're not. We'll let you guys go. And we're just going to stay here because, you know, the war's over kind of a thing. So, so where are you going to march to? There isn't any place to march. The Russians are coming here, and the, and the Americans are coming this way, and the English are they're all coming this way. There isn't any, there's a very little corridor left. Where are you going to go? So anyhow, it was decided that, yes, okay, we would, we would stay. Uh, they pulled out of there, oh, like 9, 10 o'clock one night. And the, and the only thing that w we didn't like to see was they all walked out with a Red Cross parcel. In there. That was our food, which we weren't getting, okay? But anyhow, they walked out with, each of them walked out with one of the darn Red Cross parcels under their arm. And, and so that was the last we saw of them, obviously. But then the Russians came up, and this, this one little guy, I don't know what he was. Anyhow, they, they, were, they were mostly like pickets. And they were, they were on horseback and everything, but there were some tanks around. So anyhow, the tanks came up, and this guy was, he was adamant. He says, tear these fences down. This, you know, he made it be known that we should tear these fences down. These guys have been incarcerated long enough. And, and no, we're happy to, and content to stay here. But anyhow, they brought the tanks up, and they just ran down the, ran down the barbed wire and just took it all, tore it all down. A lot of guys took off. And... Uh, the rest of us stayed, and it was just a couple of days later that there was a there was a small airfield near us, and they brought B-17s in, and you know they had laid two by fours across the bomb base, and we sat there and whatever. I think they put 20, 20, 20, 22 or 24 people in in a in a in a B-17, and we flew they flew us out of there, flew us into 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 uh, France, and uh, they were they were dictated to by the Russians that there was a very narrow corridor that you could fly, and some of them got out of that corridor and they were shot at by the Russians. Uh, they didn't knock any down, but they were shot at just because they weren't flying in that corridor. You know, you heard these stories about people being off course and what have you. Well, they were off course and they got shot at. So, anyhow, we got the lucky strike, Camp Lucky Strike in, in, in uh, uh, France, and we were there for a month. But we left there. We, we, we came back on a, uh, on a uh, troop ship. Uh, Eisenhower came down to talk to us and he said, okay, we're going to get you guys home as soon as we can. Would you mind if you got doubled up on this troop ship? No, we didn't mind. We wanted to get home. That was, you know. And so um, the, this troop ship had, had bunks that were five deep, I think it was. And uh, so we, they put us aboard first, and then they brought some infantry guys aboard, and that ship was just jam-packed. I mean, they were laying in the aisles and everything else. Went back to, uh, to Santa Ana from where I had first gone when I had enlisted, got back to Santa Ana and got discharged. Uh, and that was in uh, October of 1945. And so then it was in January of 1946 then that I wanted to went to work for Security Pacific National Bank, and uh, I worked there uh, in the Santa Monica office and then changed jobs. And in 19, uh, 1963, we moved to Orange County, moved to Placentia. Uh, I, I retired in January of 1986 after having spent 40 years with the bank. Um, it's, uh, you know, it was a, it was, uh, I'm enjoying retirement immensely. Uh, I don't, I don't, you know, people ask me, are you busy all the time? And I said, yes, I manage to keep busy all the time. Well, what do you do? Well, when you, you know, when you sit right down at the end of the day and you say, well, the day's gone, what did I do today? And really, you didn't do an awful lot, but you were busy all the time. Yeah. Well, you know, and uh, so that's, that's, in a nutshell, that was, uh, that was what I did in the Great War. The B-17 literally destroyed Germany and its allies with a never-ending assault of bombs. Dick Hubotter saw the heat of battle in the air and was able to survive the hardships of a POW camp. To this end, America was able to become superior in the air with planes like the B-17 and men like Dick Hubotter. I'm Parker Gasper for Living History. <laughs>